Now it's half past eight. Saturday night theatre. Oxford, 1662. Another procession. Since the king came in, they dare more ritual every day. I like not priests nor vestments. The organs in the churches and the singing men in surplices are all come back. These are university students. See how they fought their surplices? Down with surplices! Down with all vestments! Off, off with their surplices! Off with them! Off with them. Hold your hands, fire! Keep singing! 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 <laughs> There'll be some torn gowns to mend in Oxford before that scuffle ends. I cannot have mind me one. Which side shall we take, William? Neither side. A plague on both your houses! Come, William, to the fray. Uh, join in, if you will, John Locke, but I like not outward trappings nor loose brawls for strip surpluses. Neither can shape true belief. It is but frolic, William. Come! Nay, John Locke, I will watch you. Run, run! Where are Proctors? Run, run! Where are Proctors? Your name and college, sir. Sir, come back, sir. Dr. Fell, the Dean of Christchurch, would like to know your name, sir. I do not like thee, Dr. Fell. The reason why I cannot tell. Only this I know full well. I do, I do not, not like thee, Dr. Fell. Your name, boy? William Penn, sir. Who was your companion? Answer, sir. Sir, I shall not. Have you had a share in this riot, pray? No, sir. You seem to have taken no part against it. Sir, I was but a witness of what took place, crossing the high street as the procession came out of Tell Street. I know you well, young man, and where your sympathies lie, you have already been fined for non-attendance at chapel. Explain why I now find you here laughing at the discomfiture of a procession organised by your own college, Christchurch. Ceremonies do not please me, sir. You are disposed, therefore, to mock religion as practised at this university. For any other religion but what I have truly felt in my heart, I care not. It is plain to see that you care not for the national way of worship. Sir, to gain a better understanding of religion is surely one purpose of our coming to Oxford. I have little time for argument, Mr. Penn. I have heard of your writings against the services of the church, and I now find you sharing in a disgraceful riot. I will see to it that you are expelled from this university. The Holy Experiment by William Fox with Richard Pascoe as William Penn. Under the trees lie the lily pond, I told them, with a book of poetry. Mr. Milton's Lycidas. To scorn delights and live laborious days. A wise precept, but difficult, on such a beautiful afternoon. <laughs> Whom didst thou tell, Mother? Thy stepfather. We can sit on the grass, and they on the wooden seat. They? Visitors? Oh, Mother, why cannot Patience, they stay with Patience, Guglielma. Only one. A young man from London who has just spent eight months in the tower for his beliefs. So we must cherish him. Ah, here they come across the lawn. Eight months in prison. How dreadful for him. <laughs> but is he a friend? But so debonair he looks, and with a plume in his hat. Very young Quaker-like. His father is an admiral, much admired at court, but thou shalt judge. Here we are, Isaac. My wife Mary, thou hast already met friend William Penn. This is her daughter, Guglielma Maria Springett, my stepdaughter. Guglielma, William Penn. Your servant, Mistress Springett. To kneel and kiss my hand, Mr. Penn sends me done. What greeting can I give thee? Your pardon? For intruding myself into your private walks. Thou art very welcome here. I prosper in thy kindness. Such beauty is refreshing. It is as though I saw and smelt flowers for the first time. At last thou art free, William, after many weary months. Oh, it is naught now. Oh, this is heaven indeed. 
Where wilt thou go now? Has thy father forgiven thee? He would not see me, but I think he is relenting. I am sure he loves thee, and that will conquer in time. He has bidden me to go at once to Ireland. To Ireland? To serve my father's friend, the Duke of Ormond. My father has estates in County Cork. And shalt thou obey and go to Ireland, friend? Mr. Springett, you show distaste for talk of lords, lieutenant, and castles. <laughs> you are right, of course. I tell you directly that what I would much prefer to do is to stay and preach and write, if possible, in Buckinghamshire. Now I have found my way here to Amersham. Thy confinement in prison grieves us all. But may I ask thee, William Penn, how thou canst seek to be a preacher when thy manners are those of the court and not the meeting house? I try to speak what is in my heart. May a Quaker not so speak? May he dress like a courtier? Your garden here is full of colour. With it, the flowers reflect God's delight in them. So must all God's creatures therefore go in drab? <gasps> well, thy logic is undeniable, yet thou speakest even truth with a courtier's flourish. And that is strange in one who professes to be a Quaker. One who should scorn delights and live laborious days. <laughs> I have read Mr. Middleton's poem. Others, too, in which he speaks for beauty and delight. Sabrina fair, listen where thou art sitting, under the glassy, cool, translucent wave, with twisted braids of lilies, knitting the loose trains of thy amber dropping hair. Do not evade my meaning, friend. <laughs> I fear it may be an impossible aim for me to scorn delights and live laborious days. Why so, William? We are aware of thy suffering already in prison and at the hands of thy family. So we wait to hear, friend William, all three of us, <laughs> why it should be impossible. <laughs> if you will bear with me. You see, my father is a courtier, and I am tainted. Here, in this garden, I see you calm, secure in mind, cheerful in spite of suffering. Unlike my father's house here, there is no frivolous talk, no vain chiming of words, no butterflies of speech. Why, at my father's house, one may even meet actresses at noisy supper parties. Thy conversion, if such there be, has been a slow one. I confess it. Yet it develops especially as I meet such friends as Pennington's and Springett's. Above all, it has been influenced by my beloved friend, Thomas Lowe, lately dead. A true friend of whom we all have heard. I hear, too, about your book, William. No cross, no crown. I owe its title and more to Thomas Lowe. On his deathbed, he took my hand and said, Dear heart, bear thy cross. Stand faithful to God and bear thy testimony in thy day and generation. And God will give thee an eternal crown of glory that none shall take from thee. When, friend William, mayst thou expect thy crown? So far, there are only crosses. They began when I was sent down from Oxford. However I've distressed you, Father, I hope you will allow me to speak in my defence. My conscience is quite clear. Nothing you can say will be to the purpose. Mother, prevail with him. I intend to flog you as they flog a common sailor. No, Will, no, you shall not. I know you mean not to be so cruel. I know you love the boy as much as I do. Please, Will. Leave this to me, Peg, I entreat you. You seem not to understand the measure of his disgrace. He has ruined his career and sets fair to ruin mine. How can I, how can any of us, raise our heads at court with a shame like this upon us? He's still so young, Will. For my sake, talk no more of flogging. Oh, mother, don't cry. Margaret, for your sake, I will not flog him in front of you. But he shall be flogged, and that now. <gasps> Thinking of his hurts, he may forget his precious conscience. Do but hear him out, Will. Father, once when we were staying in Ireland, a Quaker called Thomas Lowe came to our house. Though I was very young, I observed what effect his preaching had. A Negro slave you had at that time in your service could not contain himself from weeping aloud. And looking at you, I saw tears running down your cheeks also. Uh, the right way to worship God is to go to church boy of 17 should not set up in judgment against his pastors and masters. You have defied God and the church, the king, and all authorities set over you. A fine way to honour your father and your mother. I love you both very dearly, and I have not defied God. 
I have defied man-made creeds. No man has the right to force others to worship God in any one way. Nonsense! The church teaches us all how to worship. Religion is the revelation of God to the individual, not, not a church committee formed to issue God's orders. A church a committee? Enough. Go to your room, boy. You have convicted yourself by your own tongue. But Father! Enough of words! Will I beg you? Let there be no more intercession for the boy. He shall be soundly thrashed and turned out of doors. Bitter usage, but not unexpected. Poor William. Fathers can be stern and unyielding. Guglielma's father was equally uncompromising. He was brave. I never knew him. He was killed a few weeks before I was born. A soldier of the Commonwealth. He was 23. Guglielma's mother is brave, too, and full of understanding. Oh, fie, Isaac. <laughs> I cared nothing about religion when I was young, William, and ran into many excesses and vanities, as carding, dancing, singing and frequenting of music meetings, and very unlike our meeting house close by here. Therewith much jovial eating and drinking, too. And I would often say to myself, what is all this to me? I do these things because I am sad, I am weary. It is not my delight, it hath not power over me. But Isaac is quick in apprehension, and he's mild too, and has helped me to a knowledge of how to serve the Lord, acceptably. And thy mother, William, she surely took thy part, and made the Admiral forgive thee? She did, but my father has had much to suffer from me since, these seven years since. At first, when I was in France, learning to drink admirable wine, gaming, and flaunting extravagantly with aristocratic friends, he was happy. Even when I fought a duel in Paris, he was not displeased. But swords? I wore a sword always until this last imprisonment. The wearing of it saved my life in Paris. One night, a person waylaid me with his naked sword in his hand. For what purpose? To rob me? <laughs> no. No, he said that I'd taken no notice of him when he did civilly salute me with his hat. The truth was, I saw him not when he did it. An apology might have smoothed the matter over. Oh, perhaps, but I drew, and luckily, after a few passes, managed to disarm him. <laughs> His honour was quickly healed. I suppose one of you had killed the other. You may well suppose. Nevertheless, death was waiting for me in London, and in its most terrible form. My father recalled me to study law at Lincoln's Inn in the time of the Great Plague. God was merciful to spare thee a second time, William. Here at Amersham we ran no risk at all from plague, so God was merciful to us no less. Ah, you're pleasant country air it was that kept young bones strong and young cheeks pink. I thank the Lord for it. But now it would not be fitting to outstay a welcome I shall treasure, so I'll take my leave. But thou shalt come and visit us again, William. Promise. Please do, friend William. Have I Mistress Guglielma's permission? Let it be soon, friend. With your permission, it will. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow? Tomorrow. We talked in my study for half an hour. Now he's gone to call upon blind Mr. Milton at Chalfont. And will return here on his way back to London. For the purpose he is determined upon. But Isaac, he will not speak to Guglielm after such a short acquaintance. He intends to, nonetheless. He showed yesterday oh. that he is a man of strong will. He is also very young and impetuous. Does he know that Guglielma is an heiress, with land and estates in Sussex, and so in need of protection from fortune seekers? I told him in words that were very like Mary. He replied that the Penn family has large estates in Ireland and a castle at Shanagarry, that fortunes were unimportant. But he supposed he was also to inherit from a father who was a leading figure at court and a friend of the Duke of York. Hmm. Guglielma, poor child, we will say thou art not well. That thou art from home today. Anything will serve so long as thou shalt not see him. Yes, it is best to leave this to us. Thy mother and I will... Bear the brunt of whatever youthful impatience he displays. No, mother. I what? will see him and speak with him. It is only just. We must know each other's minds. But first I must know what else he has said to my stepfather. Dear child, very little. When I tried to disparage such hastiness, he too insisted that it was between thee and him alone, no other intervening. His asking of permission was merely an expression of respect. He intended to pursue his suit, notwithstanding. Is that all he said? 
No word of his faith. Now, what practical undertaking has he made to you, to mother, to anyone, about his obligations as a Quaker? Or will he continue all his life to preach and to write, or will he not? I confess I have my doubts of it. Then does he propose to haunt the ante-rooms of Whitehall, or does he intend to live in Ireland on his father's estates? Well, either would be insupportable to me, unthinkable. He spoke of managing the estates in Ireland, indeed of being for long a pillar of Dublin society, admitting he lacked the grave mien of a true man of peace. He has ceased to wear his sword, we know. There is worse. Mm -hmm. He has won soldierly honours in a battle. Oh, he told me with some shame. He has fought in war. Oh, to be fair, a skirmish more, I, I think a brush, with insurgents, while serving under the Lord Lieutenant. Do thou send him, dear stepfather, when he comes, out to the trees by the lily pond. And alone, please, mother. I'm not happy that such a man should offer me his love, and I shall tell him so. William, I have kept silent this long while. Thy eloquence and passion are like a poet's, and I'm overwhelmed, but Do hear me out. Mo I am not in a way to return thy love. Then I will study to overcome your reason for it. My reasons are few, and all of a piece. I know what they must be. Allow me to speak. To define my feelings for one whose offer of marriage is made at only a second meeting. William, I have much uneasiness. Certain things, with the outward show of clothes, of speech, of manners, they reflect for me no inner simplicity, no true grace. Yes, Wait! Then thy family and estates give thee just that kind of worldly background which I have sworn never to let concern me. For the high circles in which they and you move could never discover the kind of friends I seek. Above all, I cannot be convinced Goody that after Elmer, only a... You speak my heart about these things. I share your dislike of them. Together, we could find peace and the will to work for all mankind. No, William, not peace. A marriage between us two would bring restlessness and an uncomfortable struggle between two worlds. Well, they're such different worlds. Mine is simple. Small with such endeavours as a country life can compass. A world of prayer. Dear Guglielmo, with every word you disturb my sensibility. You shame me most tenderly. At least you must accept my avowal of love for you. However unable you may be to return it at present. I shall profit from your example. And you will see how, one day quite soon, God willing, I will have come a little nearer to your pattern of a man. William, I do accept it. In spite of all, I do. If I long to be able to return it, I long to, above everything, to be convinced that thou art unequivocally a Quaker. Unequivocally and totally. Is a vocation a convincement? I think I have a true vocation. In Ireland, I went to a Quaker meeting where I met friend Thomas Lowe again. Friend Thomas, the glory of the world overtook me in Dublin, and I was ready to give myself unto it. But I have been thinking of the dealings of God with my soul, and especially in the time of the great plague in London. Speak to us of this, friend. It may help to ease thy burden. Friend Thomas, I was in London that woeful summer. Nightly, the bellman rang his bell crying, bring out your dead. I saw the long processions of beers, the bearers' heads muffled, and they carried torches. I saw the piles of corpses in the graveyards. White crosses marked the houses where plague had struck. Two thousand died weekly in August, more, nearly ten thousand in September. The city was full of silence. No boats plied on the river, and the grass grew in the street. You speak of easing a burden. Dublin could not, though I restlessly sought it there. My soul wanders for rest. Friend, there is a faith that overcometh the world, and there is a faith that is overcome by the world. Such dreadful experience cannot be understood. They are a test of our faith. 
Of what quality is your faith? This is an unlawful assembly. Thomas Lowe, I arrest you. Leave him alone, soldier. He's in the right. Who are you, young man, to gain save me? One who knows as much about fighting as you do. Be uh, off. You have no call right here. Friend William, thou hast done wrong. We have no wish to use force to meet force. Christ bade us turn the other cheek. I fear I give him no help. It only made matters worse. He's gone to fetch others. Let us now continue the meeting. <clears throat> Friends, we must trust in the Lord and ever hold his name this is in our hearts. an unlawful assembly. Seize these men. You do not belong here, young sir, dressed as you are in such finery. Sergeant, I would be with my friend. Go quickly, sir. Be off with you, and I will not arrest you. Know that I have no desire to be free if these are taken. You are a fool, then. Take him to jail with the others. Oh, no. Mother, I have become a friend, a Quaker. <sighs> we must try to understand, William. I so fear your father will find it difficult at first. Try not to anger him. <laughs> he was so pleased to see you yesterday in spite of his cold reception of you. Remember, it's hard for a father to hear that his son is in prison. But, Mother, we were in jail but two or three days. Yes, I think your father may be disposed to overlook this. He, he noticed yesterday how well you bore yourself and how polite you were. It softened his anger to see you dressed in lace and ruffles with sword and plumed hat, not in the drab, grey, Quaker clothes he'd feared. Ah, oh, well, I'm glad to see you come home so early. You bring better news, hope of peace at sea. I can see it plain. Better news? No. Oh, well. The business of the peace is quite dashed again. Not content with the late humiliation of our fleet in our own river Thames, the Dutch now threaten before Dover. Thy servant, father, I am happy to see thee. Son William, do not thee and thou me, if you please. Have the courtesy also to remove your hat in the presence of your parents. Not to do so shows a want of respect and is the behaviour neither of a Christian nor a gentleman. Oh, father, I have behaved both as a Christian and a gentleman, but I am a Quaker now, and friends take off the hat to none but God. How then do you intend to behave at court? You are a king's officer, son of a commissioner of the navy. Will you wear your hat in the presence of your prince? I would ask for a little time to think that question over, father. Why? In order to consult the ranters? You will make a decision now, sir, without delay. Then I must say no, sir. I will not doff my hat to mortal man. Not even to the king and the Duke of York? No, sir, not even to the king and the Duke. Son William, I am at pains ever to understand you... At court in Ireland and here in London, too, all praise your demeanour and bearing. Even Samuel Pepys in our Navy office this morning told me he found you now a most modish person, a fine gentleman, even to the extent of a great deal, if not too much, of the vanity of the French garb, with a like affected manner of gait and speech. And yet you will persist in this abhorred tendency to Quakerism. The Quakers are a dangerous people. They are shameless, immodest. I will have no dealings with them. I will kneel down and pray to God that my son shall not again go to a Quaker meeting. Alas, Father, rather than listen to that prayer, I will throw myself from the window into the street. My father is very grievously displeased. Oh, no. He bid me take my clothes and be gone from his house, for I should be there no longer. He said he would dispose of his estates to them that pleased him better. Thy mother, she will hold to thee. My mother has lost patience with me since I would not be at the christening of my sister's child. She kissed me at parting and wept, but she did not gainsay my father. Ah, well, it is a cross for thee to bear, William. Where wilt thou live in a two's charge? I know not, but I trust the Lord will show me a way. May he do so. I would consult you about another matter, George Fox. I'm loath to give up carrying my sword. The wearing of it saved my life in Paris and without harm to my attacker. Moreover, Christ bid his follower to sell his garment and buy a sword. What advice have you to give me? 
Wear it as long as thou canst, William. As long as thou canst. What didst thou do, William? And where didst thou go? I stayed with George Fox, and with him began to preach and write as a Quaker. But not for long, for I was soon in more serious trouble. My most recent trouble. The Tower. Sent there for what the Bishop of London considered to be a blasphemous pamphlet. Prisoner, stand. The governor. You have asked to see me, young man. I owe respect to your father, otherwise they would not have agreed to come. I am a political prisoner, Sir John, and not a malefactor, which is how I am treated. You are to be treated with extreme civility for your blasphemous opinions. Shall I be allowed to see my family and friends? That is not permitted. Do you carry a message from my father? None. A freeze in here, Sir John. May, may I take some exercise in the courtyard to keep warm? Even the Thames is frozen this winter. You are not permitted to leave this cell. Then may I be transferred to a warmer one? Those who disobey the law must suffer for it. Take heed, Sir John. And take heed those who sent me here. I never shall recant. I am to inform you that the bishop has vowed that unless you do recant, you shall die in the tower. Then all is well. Tell my father who I know will ask thee, I owe my conscience to no mortal man. My prison will be my grave before I will budge a jot. Son William, a royal duke is owed civility at least. James, Duke of York, is now your only hope. Ah, Sir William. Your grace, your grace is most generous to give us audience. Many speak well of the book your son has written while in the tower, Admiral. No cross, no crown. Have you read it? No, Your Grace, nor do I intend to. Why is that? Because, sir, no cross, no crown has been a serious cross to me. <laughs> do you hear that, William? You are a trouble to your family. I sent for you here to Whitehall Palace this morning because your mother has fretted herself to severe illness on your account. My mother ill? Is the heaviest part of the burden laid on me. Son William, what mean you? The burden is of your own choosing. Yes, Father. In following the will of Almighty God, I bring suffering on those I love. How dare you say it is God's will that you cause your mother suffering? Admiral. Your Grace. Young man. How old are you? Twenty-five, sir. How long have you lain in the tower? Nearly eight months. Hmm. If I were to release you, would you undertake never to preach or write again? I would require your word of honour. I cannot give it, sir. There is only one alternative, you know. The tower is a strong argument for accepting the bargain. The tower is the worst argument in the world. It silences many. None can silence truth forever. Your, your Grace, the boy's imprisonment affects his answers. I think not, Admiral. The boy has an enviable spirit. Why can he not use it for his country? Answer, William. England is a better cause. Sir, I am fighting for my country. I would say you are fighting to turn us all into Quakers. I fight for liberty of conscience, for the day when England shall give tolerance and shelter to all men of whatever race or creed. What? Even Catholics? Of course. I will remember that. Sir William. Your Grace. I will give orders for your son's release as soon as it can be arranged with the governor, Sir John Robinson. I do this entirely for your sake and to preserve our old friendship. Oh, how can I thank your grace? William, his grace the Duke deserves a great deal more than mere gratitude. What can you say to him that will ensure a more proper conduct in future? Thank you, sir. We must pray that your mother recovers soon. Try and come with your parents to court sometimes. The heir to the earldom of Weymouth will be looked for there. The heir to the earldom of Weymouth? His Majesty, my brother, has offered your father the title. Sir, I cannot succeed to the title. <sighs> Not succeed? What does the boy mean? My religion will allow no title. 
The boy is unhinged, sir. Do but consider his long confinement. No, Sir William. His mind is clear. To give up great honor for religion requires courage as well as faith. God grant I should have enough of both if such a decision should ever be mine. God will give you strength, sir. William has been given great strength, Mother, enough to withstand every test of his faith. It is well thou art convinced, good Elmer, but what of his real purpose? Before he arrived from visiting Mr. Milton at Chalfont, nothing would do but thou must send him packing for his very impertinence to come making protestations of love at only a second meeting. And now, only an hour later, no sign of any censure. I cannot explain it, Mother, so do not persist. Guglielma. No, nor my stepfather, neither. William Penn is a brilliant preacher and persuasive. Thy mother and I would like only to be assured that thou hast not been swayed by sophistry or clever flattery uh, to which thou art unaccustomed. Kneeling and kissing of hands will never alone make a marriage. Stepfather, I have said nothing to thee of marriage. So do not thou continue to examine me upon it. Will he visit thee here again? William has returned to London. He will consult friend George Fox about a ministry to Ireland. Friends, friends, we must somehow make them see that we are peaceful people who mean no harm to them. Friend George, even our quiet meetings will be feared as political conspiracies under the new act just passed, the Conventicle Act. Friends, I have some little influence with some of those in high places, in Ireland especially. May I be allowed to continue my ministry over there, where many hundreds of our brethren lie in prison? How shouldst thou fare better than the silver voice of friend George Fox? Nay, nay, friend William hath just reason and may succeed where I did fail. So far from securing releases, my preaching seemed only to result in more arrests. Friends, I mean simply that I have been brought up with these people have dined with them, and I say it with sorrow, have fought with them. Beside them, friend William, thou shalt go to Ireland in God's good time. So go now and rest, for the preaching is arduous there. The long ride to Amersham is arduous too, and thou must undertake it as often as thou canst. And there is friend William Mead with news that by his face seems urgent. Friend George, Hmm? there are gathered close by in Grace Church Street some who ask for guidance. They would have expounded to them by one of us our tenets and beliefs. How many are there gathered, friend Mead? But a handful. And as I am no preacher, I seek one who is. They will not tolerate our meetings out of doors. This is dangerous and like to be some snare to persecute us further. Friend George, I will go on my way with friend Mead here and see what is to be done. Above everything, William, take care not to get up to preach to them in the street. Caution will be our motto. Come, friend me. Friend George, it is possible to espy some vanity in friend Penn that is not seemly. Well, what meanest thou, friend? If I mistake not, that is a wig that he wears. He has suffered much in the terror, not least the loss of all his hair. Better go bald than put on vain adornment. Oh, it is but a little civil border. Thin, plain and short, a very short, simple thing. He wears it to keep his head and ears warm and not for pride. His periwigs cost him many pounds apiece formerly when he was in the world. And now this little thing, but, oh, five shillings. And he's more ready to fling it off if a little hair comes than ever he was to put it on. Pat, me, both are arrested. What? Soldiers waited for them beyond the crowd. The crowd? Friend Mead described but a handful. Three hundred at least, it was a trap. Did friend Penn attempt to preach to them? He scarce had opened his mouth when the soldiers pulled him down. They showed a warrant previously prepared. Penn and Mead are marched to Newgate. Newgate? I must go immediately to London. Nay. Do not try to stop me, stepfather. Dear child, they will not allow dissenters entry to the prison to visit other dissenters. <gasps> Have patience. There is nothing we can do. I will go nevertheless, I must. And whether thou and my mother drive with me or not. My child. I have detected flaws of thought and behaviour in William from the beginning. They are yet within him and may never cease to bedevil him, but I am endowed with love for him. Now I'm certain of it. 
That day by the lily pond at our first meeting, in my deepest heart I knew at once that he had come for whom I am reserved. Dear child, there is to be a trial. George Fox writes me that it is set down for next week. Your mother and I will go with thee to London and stay with thee throughout his days of trial. At least we may catch a glance of him at the old Bailey. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. All manner of persons being silent upon pain of imprisonment. Silence in the court. Bring William Penn and William Mead to the bar. What say you, William Penn and William Mead? Are you guilty as you stand indicted, in manner and form as aforesaid, or not guilty? We confess ourselves to be so far from recanting the assembling of ourselves to preach, pray, or worship the eternal, holy, just God that we declare to all the world we believe it to be our indispensable duty to do so. You are not here for worshipping God, but for breaking the law. I affirm I have broken no law, and I desire you would let me know by what law it is you prosecute me. Upon the common law. Where is that common law? Oh, you, you must not think that I am able to run up so many years and so many cases which we call common law to answer your curiosity. This answer, I am sure, is very short of my question, for if it be common, it should not be so hard to produce. You are an impertinent fellow. Will you teach the court what law is? It is lex non scripta, case law which many have studied 30 or 40 years to know. Well, certainly if common law be so hard to be understood, it is far from being common. But if Lord Cook be any consideration, he tells us that common law is common right. Where? To Cook's Institutes, page 56. I, 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 sir, you are a troublesome fellow. And it is not for the honour of the court to suffer you to go on. I have asked but one question, and you, you have not answered me, though the rights and privileges of every Englishman be concerned in it. If I should suffer you to ask questions till tomorrow morning, you would never be the wiser. That is according as the answers are. Now take him away! My Lord Mayor, if you take not some course with this pestilent fellow to stop his mouth... We shall not be able to do anything tonight. Take him away. Turn him into the bail now. Must I be taken away because I plead for the fundamental laws of England? Cook's Institutes, page 56. Ah, silent, now. I am not to be silent in a case which concerns not only I, but thousands of families besides. Take him away. You deserve to have your tongue cut out. But who are these judges? Well, the recorder of London has with him on the bench the Lord Mayor and that governor of the tower that was so cruel, Sir John Robinson. Oh. Tomorrow we shall hear the verdict. Woman, deliver your verdict. Not guilty. You are a sickly, impudent, canting fellow. Twice now you bring in a false verdict. You shall not be dismissed. Till we have one, the court will accept, and you shall be locked up without meat, fire, and tobacco. You shall not think thus to abuse the court. We shall have a verdict by the help of God, or you shall starve on it. You are Englishmen. Mind your privilege. Give not away your rights. They must have had a hideous night. Not being allowed even a chamber pot, though desired. And this morning... The brave jury faced the recorder once more. Not guilty. Your verdict is nothing. You play upon the court. How? Is not guilty no verdict? No, it is no verdict. If not guilty be not a verdict, then you make of the jury and Magna Carta but a mere nose of wax. What hope is there of ever having justice done when juries are threatened and their verdicts rejected? Stop his mouth! Jailer, jailer, bring fetters and stake him to the ground. Do your pleasure. I matter not your fetters. <laughs> yes, Mother, that was bad enough. But when they heaped further abuse on the foreman and the recorder threatened to cut his nose, well, that was too much for William to bear. It is intolerable that my jury should be thus menaced. Are they not proper judges by the great charter of England? My Lord Mayor, 
Till now I never understood the reason of the policy and prudence of the Spaniards in suffering the Inquisition amongst them. And, and certainly, it will never be well with us till something like the Spanish Inquisition be in England. Last night, the jury were forced into their room, we were told, to face another night of discomfort. But at seven o'clock this morning, they tottered into court, hungry, thirsty, shivering, filthy, but unbroken. Their verdict was the same. And this time, the bench could but give in. They were beaten. I demand my liberty being freed by the jury. No, no. You are in for your fines. Fines for what? Contempt of court. Take him away. Take him away. Take him out of court. I never urged the fundamental laws of England, but you cry, take him away. Take him away. But it is no wonder, since the Spanish Inquisition has so great a place in the recorder's heart. God Almighty, who is just, will judge you for all these things. And prisoner and jury were hauled off to Newgate for non-payment of their fines. <sighs> Where is Guglielma? Why is she not returned with thee? She insisted on following to the prison, and alone. If she could not gain entry, she determined somehow to get a message from William. Afterwards, she has a mind to go visit the Admiral, his father. Mm -hmm. He's very ill and dying, they say. Lielma Maria Springett, Sir William. I bring you a message from your son. Uh, <clears throat> Mistress Springett, as you can see, I am failing a little. My eyes more than the rest of me. But they can still inform me of beauty. You are a beautiful girl. Oh. <laughs> are you also a true friend of my son? With God's blessing, and your blessing too, we will be married when... When he shall be restored to you. Yes. I am glad. Do but read his letter. You must be my eyes. Dear Father... I desire thee not to be troubled at my present confinement. It is more grievous and uneasy for me that thou should be so heavily exercised than any living worldly concernment. I am clear by the jury, and they in my place, and demanding every six hours their freedom by advice of counsel. I entreat thee not to purchase my liberty. How? Not pay his fine, he means? He has no mind to let his victory go. To pay the fine would be to admit the justice of it. He will stand out against it until they repent them of these proceedings. My child, old men with little time before them. That is clear. Must be you, Matt. I want my son home. But he has entreated thee most strongly. I shall entreat him very handsomely when he is home. He has suffered so many times in his young life, not least from me. And I have come to respect him at last when it is all but too late. I long to see him. And so, I have sent the money privily to the court to pay his fines and those of his steadfast jury. Son William, you are come at last, but not to reproach me. No, father. Yeah. I am weary of this world. I would not live my days over again if I could command them with a wish. For the snares of life are greater than the fears of death. This troubles me, that I have offended a gracious God that has followed me to this day. God will forgive us all, Father. <laughs> Son William, if you and your friends keep to your plain way of preaching and keep to your plain way of living, you will make an end of the priests to the end of the world. Bury me by my mother... Live all in love, shun all manner of evil, and I pray God bless you all, and he will bless you. The father being now dead, his son is left naked of patronage from Whitehall. And we of the City of London may even our account with Ranter Pen to humble him. Hmm? Mr. Recorder? My Lord Mayor, to destroy him would give me the more pleasure. 
and I have devised a way to do it. <laughs> Sir John Robinson, how say you? Why, that but for the misguided intervention of the Duke of York, the man Penn would still be my prisoner in the tower. <sighs> Mr. Recorder, how may we pull him down? His sect forbids the taking of oaths of allegiance to any but God. Let him be hauled before this bench of magistrates, and you may administer to him the oath of allegiance under the act. Is your name Penn? <coughs> Hast thou forgot me? I do not know you. If not, why didst thou send for me hither? Tender him the oath. Thou knowest I cannot. I am sorry you should be put to this severity. It is no pleasant work to me. These are but words. You are an ingenious gentleman, all the world must allow, and you have now a plentiful estate. Why do you then associate yourself with such simple people? I confess I have made it my choice to relinquish the company of those who are ingeniously wicked to converse with those that are more honestly simple. I wish you were wiser. And I wish you better. Your father was my friend, and I have a great deal of kindness for you. Thou hast an ill way of expressing it. I beseech this bench to entreat the king on my account not to believe every man to be his enemy that cannot shape his conscience to the narrow forms and precepts of men's invention. No! No, no! You are sentenced to six months' imprisonment in Newgate for traitorous refusal to take the oath of allegiance to his majesty, King Charles II. That does not frighten me, and I desire God to forgive you as I do. Send a corporal with a file of musketeers along with him. No, no. Send thy lackey. I know the way to Newgate. <laughs> Friends, I rise to interrupt your silent prayers, impelled by God to speak to you carefully on behalf of our two young friends, William and Guglielma. They seek our guidance through the Lord, being engaged to set out forthwith across the seas to America. I have a great exercise on my mind there to visit out brethren in the fair land where they seek peace from persecution and freedom to practice their religion. I entreat your prayers for me on my journey and for William and Guglielma here wait in your deliberation. They have my blessing through God. May the Lord grant them yours. <coughs> Friends, I have this evening a sweet meeting among you in which God's blessed power compels me to open my heart to you. Though yet friend George has put to you my plea with more eloquence than I can summon, what therefore need I dwell on it? I shall kneel to pray again and in silence await God's judgment of this marriage I seek with friend Guglielma. Friends, the way to be rich and happy in this world is first to learn righteousness, for such was never forsaken in any age, nor their seed begged bread. And so, friends, I do ask your prayers for me, and in the goodness of your hearts for your wise conclusions, too, being desirous of marriage with friend William Penn. The Lord comfort us all. No writing, no preaching. Love is my occupation. And walking in the Sussex woods with the downs smooth above the beech forest, beckoning me to climb them. But it is a year, a year that we've been married, William. Dear heart, twelve months given up to love. Twice as many as my term in prison languishing for thee, where each week was a year. What if we languish here in Sussex? And which path shall we take today, the woodland? Thy choice is mine. This respite from crusade can never be languishment, and may its peace be lasting. Uphill, then. Yet, William, history shows men suffer boredom from lasting peace, 
And crusades were lost <laughs> by inactivity. An argument or a reproach? A loving moral. Little occupation dulls the writer's mind, the preacher's eloquence. No writing, no preaching. I remember strongly old John Milton's lines. He is long since dead, but I knew that one day soon I would be teased with Lycidas. To scorn delights and live laborious days. I would soon scorn the man who would sink into the sloth of the affections. Love is no sloth. But a marriage, an alliance, should bring strength and never weakness. Dear heart, thou art my sweet devil's advocate. What would thou have me do? Go write, go preach, or go walking with thee upon the downs this beautiful day? I would have thee take me to Bristol to speak with George Fox, who is expected there shortly from America. America. Friend George's letters have stirred glorious speculation in me, Guglielma, and much hope. I've had now a long time some idea to, to write upon the subject of America, foreseeing a possible rehabilitation there of Quaker fortunes. It could be called a holy experiment. We shall go then to Bristol to meet friend George from his boat. Nay, nay, I must write my piece at home. Have it published in London, and afterwards. Afterwards, perhaps. So you are to write again, I am happy. It has been my prayer these many months. Shall we also see George Fox again? In Maryland and New Jersey, he writes, live many Quakers, peacefully and without oppression. The governor of Maryland is a Catholic, and they live peacefully together, Quakers, Catholics, and other sects without number. All are free. Oh, William, at last, at last I see signs in thee of regeneration. And it is America that has quite transformed thee. God bless that new land. Now, start writing quickly and we may yet meet George Fox at Bristol. In good time, dear heart, in good time. England and toleration. So much too gradual in this spousal. From there he goes on a ministry to the Midlands, urgently sought by the brethren, and north from Worcester. Promise... We shall join him. Dear child, we shall meet him at Bristol. We shall go north with him, God willing, and I will write about my holy experiment. But first, we shall go walking in the high woods. <laughs> Love cannot change its habits as easily as thou seems to suppose. William! William, hasten to the house. There's news from Worcester, word of George Fox. Friend Penn. Friend William Mead. Oh, thou art welcome. Well, speak, friend. Thou hast ridden hard, I see, and from thy face the news is bad. Arrested and thrown into Worcester jail. Friend George and many with him that flock to hear him preach. Oh, no. Without him we are rudderless. In London, too, there has been a redoubling of ferocity against us. Cruel treatment of persons and estates. Friend Mead must have food and drink. At once. We have a journey before us. Where dost thou go, William? To London and the court. To Whitehall? I have the convictions of a Quaker, but the birthright of a courtier. That flaw in me that thou hast ever lamented must be put to work. It may yet avail George Fox and all my Quaker brethren. Oh, William, that thy old energy and vigour are back again is all my gladness. What wilt thou do? Use every trick I know, that I may be accepted once more at court, at the centre of events, of power, in London. And, and then, friend Penn? That is the first step. From it, the rest may follow. Come, friend Mead. We shall get sh short shrift among such as these. Was ever a crush like this? How they strut and stare. Let us seek another way, friend Penn. Twas ever thus at court, friend Mead. Most are petitioners for favour from the Duke. I, I seek old friends among his household. I have patience. Uh, friend... Friend, wilt thou convey to Mr. Secretary? Sir, if thou vowest me, I'll thou thy teeth down thy throat. Nay, good friend, but... no ranting Quakers here. Let us not stay to be so roughly used. I say let us leave while we may, friend Penn. What do you hear, sirs? You cause unseemly commotion at his grace's levy. I am to tell you that... Are you not... What is your name, sir? William Penn. Son of that Admiral Penn who died some years since, uh, that was at the Navy office. Oh, the same, friend. Ah, I've seen thee at court. It is five years and more, in truth, but I beseech thee that I may be allowed to see the Duke. Uh, His Grace is much occupied. All these about you wait for audience. 
I cannot promise you uh, an order. Well, Aston. Where hides the fellow? Sir, Aston. I require you to give notice when you propose to wait on me again. We have a long list to get through. Sir, I am detained by one pen here who makes petition to be added to that list. William Penn? You have neglected me these many years. My dear friend, your father would censure you for such want of affection to one under whose protection he hoped you would remain when he died. Aston? Conduct these gentlemen to the drawing room. I will hear them shortly. This way. Such a warmth of greeting dazzled me. That a duke should extend such a civil sort of kindness and hark to thee in thy petition for friend George and the others. And grant it. I confess I was overwhelmed too. Our thanks are indeed owed to the Duke of York, but how much more, friend Mead, to God... He it was who found those errors in the indictments that so swiftly ensured their discharge from prison. <laughs> I can <laughs> scarce believe it. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. William Penn! William Penn! Oh, you, you walked so swiftly away from the Palace of Whitehall that one might think the picket pursued you. Oh, stay, stay, my, my breath may yet return. Oh. What seek you, friend? I am no friend, sir, but friend of William Penn. Hmm? <laughs> yes, yes. John Aubrey. Very well met and remembered. John Aubrey? Yes, yes. One time, gentleman, a commoner of Trinity Call, uh, where I looked through logic and some ethics. Oh, but well, that was when Bologna thundered. I mean the Civil War. Friend Aubrey, uh, dost thou attend at court now? I do attend on history. On history? Yes, yes, at court and anywhere. His Majesty is pleased to offer himself to be entered one of our society at Gresham College Parlour. We shall then call it Royal Society. But, Mr. Penn, to business. I, I have your brave story inscribed in manuscript. Uh, education, rank, preferment, yes, also imprisonments and sad deserts of religious descent. And uh, what of your own presence here at court? I, I do know that your father was owed money by King Charles. Oh? Oh, yes. I know nothing of that, friend Aubrey. Oh, yes, yes. Now, let me see. Uh, Sir William, your father, Admiral and Captain General under the Duke of York, uh, he it was who added Jamaica to the King's possessions. And since those days, His Majesty, owing to your father, now dead, no less than £20,000 with interest for refitting the fleet from his own pocket. At Deptford it was, never repaid. Never repaid? Never repaid. And now, your father being long gone, no money in his majesty's treasury to repay old debts. Oh, yes, Samuel Pepys it was who told me, he of the navy office, who had no love for your father, though he dissembled... Friend, uh, friend, we have much work before us and must not stand to gossip in public places unless for the good of God. Good Mead, do thou go to meet friend George Fox on his release, giving him my brotherly love... Uh, uh, friend Aubrey, hmm? where can thou and I repair to hear more of thy gleanings of my father's affairs? Here is a tavern close by where the wine is drinkable very. We sully not our mouths with wine nor enter taverns. Good mead, I find I may have further business at Whitehall. If what friend Aubrey says is true, then it is for me to petition the king himself on this matter. Lead me to thy tavern, friend Aubrey, and friend Mead, hmm. go thy ways and pray with me for a miracle. Penn will petition the king for a grant of land in America. He scorns the money owed him and will forego all for a parcel of virgin earth, Mirabili Dictu. What think you, John Locke, who know the Quaker from Oxford days? Why, Aubrey, that his majesty's exchequer is bare. Though the land may be hard to come by, the money will be begged in vain. <laughs> At Oxford, our dean expelled poor Penn for brawling when I was culprit and escaped scot-free. Oh, that <laughs> fell, Doctor. Oh. <laughs> that summer, I had a terrible fit of the spleen and piles at Orleans. I returned in October. Oh, a strange year for me, full of contradictions, solicit love and lawsuits. All my affairs ran kim-cam and nothing took effect. <laughs> there is a continent of land for Penn to colonise, full of nothing but red men. How they plague us in Carolina. Does his majesty come to our society this day? Oh, he misses scarce a Wednesday. Now, if I could be rich, I could be a prince. I could go into Maryland between Virginia and New England. I can have all the favour of my lord Baltimore, of my call at Oxen that I can wish. 
I could be able, I believe, to carry a colony of rogues, another of ingenious artificers. <laughs> oh, yes, very well. But why should I, at this time of day, and being of a monastic humour, make myself a slave and roast myself for wealth? Well, success at all events to William with his petition. Mr. Penn, I am glad that this business of the American lands is at last happily concluded. I could wish, though, that my old friend, your father, had lived to enjoy this great day for his son. Friend James, I know not how my dear father would have enjoyed the idea of a Quaker colony, but I am thankful for thy support through all the long delays. I have come to consider that you Quakers are a quiet, industrious people, though in my youth I was strong against them. Honest men are none too common at my brother Charles's court, Mr. Penn. His Majesty! Hats off for His Majesty! Charles, good morning, sir. Friend Charles, why dost thou remove thy hat? Friend Penn, because it is the custom here for only one of us to be covered. <laughs> I come to invest you with your governorship. I would ask Mr. Secretary to read the charter, but that it is somewhat lengthy. He tells me it consists of 23 sections, which bids fair to keep us yawning until tomorrow dinner time. <laughs> so in order that I myself shall be informed, do you, Brother James, acquaint us with their content. The charter delivers to William Penn and to his heirs and assigns forever certain parts of America not yet settled. Twere well if I should know how large a part of my dominions I concede to Mr. Penn, for I've never studied the map. It is a great tract of land, about the size of England. It is bounded on the east by the uh, Delaware River, and on the west by the already existing state of Maryland, and runs northwards from the 40th to the 43rd parallel. Ah. Now let me hear how my poor harassed treasury is to profit by Mr. Penn's stewardship. It is free of all payment. All payment? All but two beaver skins yearly. And the fifth part of any gold and silver mined. A bargain, friend Penn. Good fortune go with you. And may you find your subjects more manageable than I find mine. <laughs> I shall have a tender care of the government, that it is well laid at first. And I thank thee right heartily, friend. But what of the name of the territory? Ah, yes, the name. Well, Mr. Secretary here tells us that you have suggested New Wales... But he is a Welshman himself with no love for Quakers, and he'll have none of it. It is a pretty hilly country, but well timbered, too. So then, may it not be called Sylvania, the woodland colony? We have added Penn to it. Pennsylvania, it shall be, and a mighty pretty name, too. Oh, nay, friend Charles, it will be looked on as a vanity in me to put my name to it. Peace, friend Penn. It is past and cannot be altered. I will take it upon me, and no more to be said. Moreover... I've named it for your father, who was dear to me. But for him, among others, America would never have come under the English crown. So I now hand you the patent of Pennsylvania and name you its proprietary governor. Would that all debts could be paid so easily. <laughs> come, Brother James. Sir. It is a clear and just thing. And my God, that has given it to me through many difficulties, will, I believe, make it the seed of a nation. Your holy experiment has begun, Mr. Penn, is it not so? It progresses, friend John. Oh, welcome. Welcome to our Royal Society. We shall have the honour to hear you discourse upon it this very day. Oh, we hope so. Come, come. Here are many you are acquainted with. All know you, for you are elected ah. Nemine Contra de Kenti. Oh, yes. And here, in the forefront of you is a philosopher, no less. John Locke. Friend John Locke. Ah, William, it is many years since we were at Christchurch together. Ah, <laughs> when I was a freshman at Oxford, I was wont to go to Christchurch to see King Charles I at supper. <laughs> yes, I... Oxen was then a garrison pro league. I did hear him say one evening that he did find once out hunting the covey of partridge fallen upon the hawk. And I do remember this expression further, viz, and I'll swear upon the book, tis true. When I told this story to my tutor, said he, 
That covey was London. <laughs> we are here for discourse, William, as you already can tell. We shall welcome yours. What is your science to be? Well, Mr. Uh, Penn is the first here of his... Um, his uh, sect? Ah, yeah, sect. <laughs> <laughs> A law proprietor come religio. Hmm, very well, very well. Now, knowest me for what I am. I, too, have toyed with the idea to enter the church, but, fuck, the cassock stinks. <laughs> It'd be ridiculous. I esteem thee, friend Aubrey, as an historian, and thee, friend John, as a philosopher. But since it was thee who drew up the constitution for the state of Carolina, I fancy a favourite science for both of us might be uh, constitution-making. Well said, well said. <laughs> then let us hear how Pennsylvania is to fare as compared with her neighbours in America. Well, friend John, I hope we can agree on civil liberty and freedom of religion... I want Christians of every denomination to be able to hold office in my colony. Why limit it to Christians? Why, indeed. Then a free democracy with every taxpayer having a vote and all elections by ballot, not show of hands. What? Give every ignorant jack a hand in government? I would have no rabble of an assembly. Well, I want all trials to be by jury and prisoners to be heard in their own defence as a right. Juries are unnecessary if judges are honest. Judges are human, John. And juries may safeguard justice. I will have no death penalty, save for murder and treason. Without the fear of death, your colony will soon be full of felons. Now, I believe in wholesale fear to keep men in their place. Does Newgate then deter our countrymen from crime? My aim is to secure the people from abuse of power. Liberty without power breeds confusion. But power without liberty is slavery. <sighs> Thine is a state of slaves, John. Well, not all black ones. Ah, yours is a dreamer state, William. Yet, please God, you may prove that men are made better by trusting them. <sighs> August 26th, 1682. Saturday. This day, about 4 p.m., W. Penn Esquire went towards Deal to launch for Pennsylvania. Ever he... in your notebook, good old oh. But it's a full year since that William has left in the ship welcome. Yes, 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 yes. But do listen to the rest, philosopher and friend. A letter from America. William Penn, law proprietor, did ex meno motu et ex gratia speciali, give me a grant under his seal of 600 acres in Pennsylvania without my seeking or dreaming it. He adviseth planting it with French Protestants seven years gratis and afterwards make them pay such a rent. All goes well. Blessed be God. The air, heat and cold resemble the heart of France. The soil's good, the springs many and delightful, the fruits, roots, corns and flesh as good as I've commonly eaten in Europe. I may say most of them better. Strawberries ripe in the woods in April, and in May, peas, beans, cherries, and mulberries. Much black walnut, chestnut, cypress, and white cedar are here. The sorts of fish are excellent and numerous. Sturgeon leap day and night that we can hear them a bow shot from the rivers in our beds. Roasted, they eat like veal. Vines grow in abundance everywhere. Some may be as big in the body as a man's thigh. I have begun a vineyard by a Frenchman of Languedoc. Utopia! Utopia! A broadsheet for utopia! God send it remains so, but Pennsylvania is not an empty land. The tribes of Indians are numerous and warlike. I warned him never to trust his own people too blindly. Will trusting work any better with Indians swarming through his territory? By now he will be aware that this must be his concern, that his whole success... Depends on his ability to win the confidence of savages. Still they come, and armed as if for war. A daunting sight, Governor Penn. Good Markham, we must be patient. We give them time to assemble. And yet I made it clear to the sergeants of the tribes that the meeting was to discuss a treaty of peace. And Governor, they are to be seen in the woods as far as the eye can carry. All the braves are in war paint, their feathers flying bright and their bows and arrows ready for action. Aye, and we are but a handful and weaponless. We must keep calm. There is no cause for dismay and none for terror. Show neither. This must be our attempt to win them over. Not by force, but by love. They will be our friends if we are friends to them. And yet, Markham, there are gathered more of them than I thought possible. 
What tribes are represented? The Taminant, their chiefs, Archem or King, is of the Leni Lenape, but others are from the Iroquois, the Delawares, the Shawnees, Mingos, and other Susquehanna tribes from still further off. I have met them in council many times here by the river under this great elm, but never in such number and with such frightful aspect. I can see squaws and children. Papooses, too. They mean no harm. See, uh, they throw down their weapons. Oh, it is well. Now they will seat themselves on the ground in semicircles, the old warriors in front and the young braves stretching rank on rank behind. Let the interpreter stand beside me uh, and give me the pale blue sash. I will put it on now. Hail to thee, on us, our friend. That is Taminant, their chief. This is the place of treaties. And by the wearing of this chaplet I put on... The ground is sacred, and no hurt shall befall any here. Speak on us, for the nations are ready to hear thee. The Great Spirit, who made me and you, who rules the heavens and the earth, and who knows the innermost thoughts of men, knows that I and my friends have a hearty desire to live in peace and friendship with you. It is not our custom to use hostile weapons against our fellow creatures, for which reason we have come unarmed. We are met on the broad pathway of good faith and goodwill. All is to be openness, brotherhood, and love. Colonel Markham, the parchment. Now, read to them the main headings of the treaty. It is agreed between us that all Christians and Indians shall be brothers as the children of one father. All paths shall be free and open to both Indians and Christians. The doors of the Christians' houses shall be open to the Indians, and the wigwams of the Indians open to the Christians. That the Indians shall do no manner of harm to the Christians, nor the Christians to the Indians. In any dispute arising, it shall be settled by twelve persons. Six Indians and six Christians. Know that we will pay fairly for the land where my people wish to settle. Know also that this ground, under the great elm tree in your place of treaties, shall forever be common ground to both our peoples. These are the terms of our treaty of friendship. Give me the parchment roll, Markham. Friends, reserve this roll and show it to your children and your children's children that they may know my words as if I were there to repeat them. We will keep this chain of friendship bright and clean without rust or spot while creeks and rivers run and while sun and moon and stars endure on us. History is strewn with the debris of broken treaties, William. Treaties with Indians not accepted. How long will yours be kept before the blood begins to flow? Before you place your own head under the scalping knives of the red men? Friend John, seven years it is since I met the red men under that great elm at Shakamaxon, the place of kings in their language. Our King James II of England was but Duke of York then. From that day to this, not one drop of Quaker blood has been shed by Indians, nor is like to be, unless neighbouring states come meddling or redcoat bands marauding. Oh, it's worked well at first, your holy experiment, but you have many enemies here in England, William, and they are sometimes heard to call it your holy illusion. Yes, yes, much bitterness here, and in my colony, too, and more ahead, I well know. Letters tell of divisions in government between my deputies. Well, these are the troubles of separation. God will settle them. With his help, I can deal with troubles in Pennsylvania. And while King James shall live, he is my strong shield in England. Princes are mortal, William. Put not too strong a trust in them. Nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. We can be powerfully independent, too, we Americans of Pennsylvania. I have an idea to move to unite 
the States. A United States of America, owing allegiance ever to the British crown. Yet you stay much in England, William, away from America. I have imagined, too, some sort of diet or estate of Europe to which all governments shall send deputies and before which sovereign assemblies shall be brought all differences between one prince and another. Does not Guilelma take ship with you next visit? She longs to come with me, but her health is hazardous and her strength so delicate. And there's much danger of smallpox for her and the children. Absence is dangerous to all absence, William. The absentee landlord most vulnerable to depredations of property and funds. <laughs> Give all my good wishes to your family in Sussex. Dearest William, since the king has been forced to abdicate, they are against those whom he favoured. But James loved thee as a singular and entire friend, and often honoured thee with his company in private for hours together, delaying to hear the best of his peers at the time waiting for an audience. So now, dear heart, I'm charged with being a papist and a Jesuit. But it worries me, William, that anyone should even imagine my husband an emissary of the Pope in disguise. <laughs> None but they who foster the idle and malicious shams of the times, my love. The ears of people everywhere are open to evil rumour. Every calumny that can be invented. Not calumny. An absurd slander, merely. I know not one Jesuit anywhere. And yet, dear heart, I am a Catholic, though not a Roman. Never. We can never be other than simple Quakers. Simple Quakers have a feeling for mankind. We dare not deny to others what we crave for ourselves. I mean, liberty for the exercise of our religion. We think faith, piety and providence better security than force. We are true Catholics. King James is a Catholic, yet it is well known you write often to him in his banishment abroad, and that upsets the subjects of Protestant William. James is still my friend. <laughs> Thou wert ever too trusting of thy friends, my dearest. Many have proved false and deceitful. In Pennsylvania? Perhaps. Yes. Our whole future we have expended on the colony, maintaining government out of private purse, so we did not burden the infant settlement. And now this monstrous claim upon thee by those to whom thou hast given trust. Legal chicaneries, no more. But unkindly used as I may be, no poor slave in Turkey desires more earnestly for deliverance than I do to be with my people there more often. Dearest... Not from love or the desire to see thee by me must I speak. To go to America at this moment will be interpreted unfavorably by thy many enemies. Thou must stay here and brave the storm. High treason. William is ever a prisoner of conscience, Aubrey. And so was arrested when he might have been safe at sea. Oh, how I hate to say it. It is said he was most scrutinizingly examined, and that of fabrication after fabrication, only his truthful and transparent answers availed him. Yes, but then, said he, the new king's act of grace looked like a pardon, and it was an acquittal, he sought. Well enough, and it should be registered for posterity. Uh, let me see, where is my father Macon? Men of calm and sober judgment, though, were among his accusers. Ah, the encroachment of ignorance on mankind. What strange absurdities man can, by custom and education, be brought to believe? Not so, William Penn. It is now above many years that he's not been very solicitous of what the world thought of him. I asked for charity towards his error, that of too much trusting, because I find no certitude in truth. Oh, sanctus simplicitus! As though to be a plain Quaker at a spangled court were not the man's most valuable asset. Indeed, he possessed more of King James's confidence than any outside the Roman pale, and more than most of those within it. <laughs> he was arch Quaker. Uh, very well, very well. So, now he is back to Pennsylvania. Yes, his wife and family follows him there shortly. To the city of brotherly love. God send he find it there. Your Excellency, I do not hesitate to declare that the wild beasts that fill your forests here can better govern than the witless zealots who make a monkey house of your assembly. We shall soon set matters right again, Markham. In my letters, I have desired, beseeched, and charged them that whatever they did, they must avoid factions and parties, whisperings and reportings, and all animosities to one another. We shall pray and speak together, and God will prevail. Sir, I have many doubts... I call them fools. 
Silly souls, liars, rotten ranters and muggletonians. <laughs> they, in turn, I suppose, call you ignorant heathen, infidel and heretic. Oh, I have never been favourite with the friends, Your Excellency, and have never hopes for sympathy and support from settlers who count me a soldier and so a shedder of blood. They know not thy worth, Markham. What reports of warring with the tribes? None. All is peace here between white man and red man. That is something to gladden me. But there is the vexed question still not agreed with Lord Baltimore about our boundaries with Maryland. The packet has arrived! The packet? Oh, good, Markham, I'm in daily expectation of seeing my wife here. I shall be sorry to be disappointed if this boat brings not my wife and family from England. Who arrives by packet? Who do you bring? Letters for the governor. Only letters? Well, then there must at least be one from my wife. Uh, letters, Your Excellency. I cannot see her seal. But there must be one. One from the King's Secretariat. Perhaps you'd like to read it, sir. No, not now. Ah, here it is. Oh. What is it, sir? My wife, she's ill. Dangerously ill, it says. The letter is written by her physician, and written three months ago, not very long after I left England. In three months, there has been time for a recovery. We must pray so. Have you a mind to sail for England, sir? I must think. Give me a little time alone, Markham. Yes, sir. Governor Penn. Yes, Markham? Lord Baltimore is gone to London to argue the boundary. Our case must be heard, too. Your voice may be needed there to rebut him. Thank you, friend Markham. I will let you know directly. Dearest William, what happiness... Dear heart. To have my husband again by my side. I was never more than a heart's beat away from thee. My children are my little loves. But it is you. You I love. I'm here now. And our children must be our future blessing. Disease has made too deep an inroad into me. Thou art yet weakly. But it will mend. No. No. I will not suffer thee, William, to neglect thy public duty. Go, my dearest. Do not hinder any good for me. I have cast my care upon the Lord. I shall see thee again. She was an entire and constant friend of a more than common capacity and great modesty and humility, yet most equal and undaunted in danger, without affectation, an easy mistress and a good neighbour, especially to the poor. She was the love of my youth, much the joy of my life. I have no dread of death. If Solomon counts the days of one's death better than the days of one's birth, they can be reckoned amongst one's remarkable and happy days. And oh, the misery of old age. Guglielma's death has affected him more than all his other troubles, and he has many. He comes shortly to see me, being on his way to reside within the rules of the Fleet Prison. For his debts? Aye, they are large. Those he left in charge of affairs in Pennsylvania have cheated him. He's compelled to mortgage his province. No use to say now I warned him of too great a trust in his fellows. Or two of the struggle with his conscience between America and Guglielma. His wife often won. And yet, in spite of all, his holy experiment may yet succeed. Pennsylvania's growth is phenomenal. Frenchmen, Dutchmen and Germans come crowding in. Though there's envy and greed among the colonists in his absence. Listen, Orbit, to this noble letter to his squabbling brethren. My old friends, it is a mournful consideration and the cause of deep affliction to me 
but I am forced to speak to the people of that province in a language I once hoped I should never have occasion to use. Friends, the eyes of many are upon you. The people of many nations of Europe look on that country as a land of ease and quiet, wishing to themselves in vain the same blessings they conceive you may enjoy. But to see the use you make of them is no less the cause of surprise to others while such bitter complaints and reflections are seen to come from you, of which it is difficult to conceive either the sense or the meaning. We must look in our hearts and remember who it was who said to his followers, Ye are brethren. Without the spirit of brotherhood, ye cannot be peacemakers who are called the children of God. William Penn died on July the 30th, 1718. He remains one of the greatest figures of American history. His treaty with the Indians, the most successful treatment of Aborigines that history records, lasted for 70 years, and his frame of government for Pennsylvania became the basis for the Constitution of the United States in 1776, 200 years ago. The Holy Experiment was written for radio by William Fox. William Penn was played by Richard Pascoe, Guglielma by Caroline John, Isaac Pennington by James Thomason, Mary Pennington by Irene Sutcliffe, Admiral Sir William Penn by William Fox, and Lady Penn by Margaret Robertson. Charles II was played by Brian Sanders, James Duke of York by John Westbrook, Sir John Robinson by John Rowe, John Locke by Peter Howell, Dr. Fell by Peter Woodthorpe, Thomas Lowe by William Edel, George Fox by Hayden Jones, William Mead by Steve Hodson, Colonel Aston by Walter Hall, Colonel Markham by Michael Tudor Barnes, and Taminant by Clifford Norgate. The Lord Mayor was played by Geoffrey Siegel, the Recorder by David Graham, the Foreman by Douglas Blackwell, the Clerk by David Neal, the Usher by Marcus Campbell, and John Aubrey by Nigel Lambert. The studio managers were Amna Smith, Lloyd Silverthorne, and Sue Templeman. The music was taken from a scherzo for recorders by Benjamin Britten. The Holy Experiment was produced and directed by Ian Cotterell.